Lex, now we're going to find out the most important story of all. When the wall came down, it did not just change the German nation, pretty much changed the face of the planet. When the wall comes down, it creates a domino effect through the rest of Europe. That kind of leads to the downfall of communism in various Eastern Bloc countries and eventually the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. So it is a very important story and for our travels in Berlin today we must know what happened. Now to, fight, to start our story off, we are going to go back in time. We're going to go back to the year of 1985. In 1985, things begin to change. Because in 1985, a new, man, a new man was made the leader of the Soviet Union. And that man's name was Mikhail Gorbachev. Gorbachev comes to power in the Soviet Union, and he brings some new ideas to politics, ideas known as glasnost and perestroika, new ideas of openness and reform. In fact, Mr. Gorbachev is the first Soviet ruler since 1952 to come to power and say, hey, you Eastern Bloc nations, you nine countries under Soviet rule, you want freedom, you want democracy, you don't want to live under the Iron Curtain anymore, then you know what? You don't have to. Because what the Soviet Union decided to do under Mr. Gorbachev was pull its armies, tanks, and soldiers out of those nine countries and go back home to take care of Mother Russia. Now, if you think about this, these countries have been trapped under Soviet rule since 1952. Gorby comes to power and says, you want freedom? You want democracy? Then go right ahead? That, of course, is exactly what they are going to strive for. Over the next few years, you see reformist governments popping up in Eastern Europe. By 1987, Poland officially becomes the first democracy in Eastern Europe. First democracy in Eastern Europe since 1952. Now Poland sets a standard for all of the nations to follow. Real nail in the coffin for the Soviet Union and for the Iron Curtain comes in the summer of 1989. Summer of 1989, a country known as Hungary officially tears down the Iron Curtain along its border with Austria. Meaning for the first time since 1952, Eastern Europeans can go down to Hungary, they can cross over that border into Austria, and they can be in Western Europe. They can live in democracy, they can live in freedom, they and their families can live their lives the way that they choose. Summer of 1989, Budapest must have been the most popular holiday destination on the continent. You pack your family, kids, car, everything you've ever owned, you drive down to Hungary, you cross that border, you and your family are now free. Now millions of people do want this so badly, they are willing to give up their homes, give up their lives in their countries, and head over to the West and try to start anew. But a lot of people, especially East Germans, say, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why should we have to run away? Why should we have to leave our country, our homes, our cities, where we have lived all of our lives, and go down to Hungary and cross into Austria to gain our freedom? We have lived here all along. Instead of going and running away to gain our freedom, these East German people decide, why can we not take a stand within our own countries? Why can we not dismantle the Iron Curtain separating East and West Germany? With this brave mentality coming into play, it all culminates into the second ever anti-communist protests in this country. First ever, as we talked about earlier, happened here in Berlin, 1953. Turns into a massacre when the Soviet Union comes in, wipes out 250 people, takes away 2,000 others never to be seen again. These people have been afraid up until now. In 1989, that second ever anti-communist protest, uh, anti-communist protest is not happening in the city of Berlin. It's focused in the south of East Germany in a town known as Leipzig. Every single Monday, people begin to gather in the streets of Leipzig protesting. Something that is unheard of in East Germany. You don't protest, you don't talk politics at all. You get caught doing that, that can get you arrested, and now these people are taking it to the streets, and they're chanting around 100 people to take to the streets of Leipzig. You can imagine the result every single time. Police come in with riot gear, batons, shields, fire hoses, beat these people, send us, say, go back home, this is not allowed, we will throw you in jail, we'll be watching you from this moment on. These people should be afraid. And every single week, no matter what the consequences are, these people are constantly taken to the streets. And what is strange is their numbers are getting larger, from 100 to 250 to 500 to 650 to 700 people. Protests aren't meant to happen in this country, let alone one that's getting larger and larger and larger. East German government realizes we've got a problem. We don't do something soon, these people are going to start a revolution. We've got to stop this right here and now. Now the guy in charge of East Germany in 1989 East German ruler was Eric Honecker. Eric Honecker, very disliked man, very stern Communist Party leader. Eric Honecker realizes he's got problems, these people aren't happy, decides, you know what? These East German people, they just need their faith restored in this country. Now what do you do when your friends are down, your friends are upset, what do you do for them? You throw them a friggin' party. He decides, well, 1989, 40th anniversary of East Germany as a nation, 1989 is great. What we'll do is we're gonna have a smashing good party here in Berlin, it's going to take place in front of the palace 
of the Republic, the lights, the works. It's going to be great. Not only that, but Eric Honecker decides to really give these people something they will love. He decides to invite a guest speaker to come speak at this 40th anniversary. Turns out that guest speaker is none other than Mr. Gorbachev of the Soviet Union. Now it was known that outside of Mother Russia, Eastern Europeans, they love Gorbachev. Gorbachev is like a communist rock star in those nine countries. I mean, he's a star. They love him. Give you an idea of how loved Gorbachev is in this country and in this city. Gorbachev gladly accepts to come speak for that 40th anniversary. When he arrives in Berlin, he's taken from the airport down to the Palace of the Republic by Carcade. And the entire route that Gorbachev has taken, he is greeted by thousands and thousands of East Germans gathering on the streets, climbing up buildings, climbing up trees, pushing back police, climbing over fences, all chanting, Gorby, Gorby, Gorby. We love you, Gorby. They're going crazy. They love this guy. Everyone's cheering for Mr. Gorbachev. Gorbachev's loving it, having a great old time. Because back in Russia, they hate him. Oh, they despise him. So to be where they love him, oh, this is fantastic. <laughs> Happens all the way down, Palace of the Public. Palace of the Republic, Gorbachev stands on that podium in front of the nation of East Germany. He delivers a speech. And in that speech, he says one line that is directed right at Eric Honecker, the East German ruler. Because what Gorbachev says in that speech is this. He says, times, times are changing, and those who do not change with the times shall be crushed by them. Now, if you're Eric Honecker, East German ruler, you invited Gorbachev to make you look good. Like, yeah, I'm friends with Gorby. This is great. They love Gorby. Now they're going to love me. Gorbachev stands on that podium, delivers a line like that. Yeah, you really aren't too happy. He's taking a direct shot at you. Now, Eric Honecker's pretty upset about what Gorbachev said. But you know who isn't? The East German people. The people in this country who want their nation back. They want East Germany back as their own. Not as a communist nation, but a nation for the people. That speech by Gorbachev, he did not only take a shot at Eric Honecker, but throughout that speech he has stated that this time around, 1989, the Soviet Union will not be sending tanks or soldiers down the streets of Berlin or Leipzig or any other East German city. Gorbachev has said to these people, if you want freedom, you want democracy, then go for it, because this time around, Mother Russia is behind you. Crowd goes ecstatic. This is exactly what these people needed to take their country back. Euphoria, joy, these people are cheering, the crowd is loving it. Now that electricity from Gorbachev's speech carries over to the following Monday, all the way down to the city of Leipzig. The following Monday, after that speech by Gorbachev, down in Leipzig, you have another protest happening. Only this time around, it's not 100 or 200, even 1,000 people, oh no. This time around, following Monday, there are over 30,000 people in the streets of Leipzig. Massive crowd of 30,000 people chanting, cheering, showing that they're not afraid, they're not going to go home, police don't know what to do. They couldn't deal with 800 people, let alone 30,000. This is chaos. East German police try to sort it out. Protests over the next few weeks gets larger and larger, around 40,000 people now. East German government doesn't know what to do. They finally decide to turn to their ruler, Eric Honecker. Eric Honecker this time around decides, you know what? First time around, I try to play nice guy. Tried to give you a party, tried to make your faith restored in East Germany. You didn't want that. You want me to be a communist ruler. No problem. Let's do it. Following Monday, another protest is going to happen in Leipzig. Eric Honecker is aware of this. It's a scheduled thing. He decides that he is going to put an end to this revolution that following Monday. Because he sends the East German army down to Leipzig. Soldiers armed and ready for combat with orders to wipe these people out. He it sends extra blood to the hospitals down in Leipzig. He installs a curfew that says, if you were caught on the streets past 7 p.m., those soldiers and police have the right to shoot you on sight without question. He then broadcasts it on the news, on the radio, on the television, everywhere, making sure every East German knows that if they protest on this Monday night, 1989, down in Leipzig, there's going to be a massacre. Now, if you are an East German, you're old enough to remember that massacre here in Berlin. You know what can happen. You know what this will potentially turn into down in Leipzig. Some of these people in 1989 had lost family had lost fathers, grandfathers, in that protest here in Berlin back in 1953. On top of this, in 1989, over in China, you had the Tiananmen Square massacre. Same scenario. People tried to rise up against their communist government. In that particular incident, 3,000 people were murdered by the communist, uh, by the communist nation. On top of that, 2,000, 3,000 others taken away, never to be seen again. These people got a lot to think about. They have to ask themselves, this Monday night in 1989 here in Leipzig, or down in Leipzig, they have to ask themselves, is freedom worth dying for? Is it worth dying for? Because you know that if you leave your house this night, you take to the streets of Leipzig, you more than likely are not walking back through that door. You are not going to see your children again, your husband, your wife. This may be the end. This may be it all. Is it worth dying for? 